got one that can see. It has been said that the greatest trick the devil ever pulled off was convincing the world he didn't exist. In this video, I am going to prove that the devil has basically achieved this trick with Jesus Christ, and that Jesus Christ is actually the devil himself. I am going to prove that the devil has tricked people into a false sense of security, into a false sense of hope, into falsely thinking he was defeated, and that the story of Jesus Christ actually made the devil stronger than he ever was. And I'm going to do this using verses from several different Bibles. Now I know not all Christians subscribe to the same Bible. However, I ask any Christians watching this to watch the video until the end. And don't just reactively comment and say, oh, well, that Bible isn't true. I don't believe what that Bible says. I believe what this Bible says. Just watch this video in its entirety and then comment. I'm going to start off with what the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints says about Satan. Satan, also called the adversary or the devil, is the enemy of all righteousness and of those who seek to follow God. He is a spirit son of God who was once an angel in authority in the presence of God. And then it cites Doctrine and Covenants 7625. And it also says, see also Isaiah 1412. So let's take a look at those chapters. So in Isaiah 1412, it says the following. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Now let's look at Doctrine and Covenants 76, 26. And was called perdition, for the heavens wept over him. He was Lucifer, a son of the morning. And we beheld, and lo, he is fallen, is fallen even a son of the morning. Now, the reason why I'm emphasizing the fact that Lucifer was a son of God, or a spiritual son of God, is because in John 3.16, we are told this, For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Let's move on. This is returning back to the Church of Latter-day Saints website and their overview of Satan. But in the primordial council in heaven, Lucifer, as Satan was then called, rebelled against God. Since that time, he has sought to destroy the children of God on the earth and to make them miserable. One primary issue in the conflict between God and Satan is agency. Agency is a precious gift from God. It is essential to his plan for his children. In Satan's rebellion against God, Satan, quote, sought to destroy the agency of man. And then it cites Moses 4.3. Now let's take a look at these two biblical verses. This is Moses 4.3. Wherefore, because that Satan rebelled against me and sought to destroy the agency of man which I, the Lord God, had given him, and also that I should give unto him mine own power, by the power of mine only begotten, I caused that he should be cast down. And he became Satan, yea, even the devil, the father of all lies, to deceive and to blind men, and to lead them captive at his will, even as many as would not hearken unto my voice. Now I just want to quickly say that the way that I interpret Moses 4.3 here is that the Lord God had given him the devil and also that I should give unto him mine own power. 
To me, I interpret this as God actually gave the devil his power. To me, this is a connection to God and Jesus Christ being equals or being one and the same. But here, God is clearly saying that he actually gave the devil his own power. And in a lot of ways, because Jesus has the power to forgive you of your sins or has the power to bring you to salvation, this is God's power. Well, the devil has God's power as well. And this is somewhat confirmed in Moses 4, 5, when it says, And now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which I, the Lord God, had made. To me, this line confirms the fact that God did indeed give the devil his own power. Now, let's go on to Moses 1. And I, the Lord God, spake unto Moses, saying, That Satan, whom thou hast commanded in the name of mine only begotten, this is clearly God saying that the devil is his only son, is the same which was from the beginning, and he came before me, saying, this doesn't mean that Satan came in time before God, it's saying that Satan went before God and said this, Behold, here am I, send me, I will be thy son, and I will redeem all mankind, that one soul shall not be lost, and surely I will do it. Wherefore give me thine honor. But behold, my beloved son, which was my beloved and chosen from the beginning, said unto me, Father, thy will be done, and the glory be thine forever. This is clearly God, or, or the devil, talking about him being Jesus. This is supposedly exactly what Jesus did. I mean, just read that again. Behold, here I am, send me. I will be thy son, and I will redeem all mankind. That one soul shall not be lost, and surely I will do it. Wherefore, give me thine honor." Is this not what Jesus supposedly did? Did Jesus not supposedly redeem all mankind? And that one soul shall not be lost? He died for all of our sins, correct? Oh, don't worry, I'm just getting started. Now, I'm just going to quickly go back and talk about this agency. How the devil, a big part of his rebellion had to do with getting rid of the agency of mankind. I believe that's exactly what the faith in Jesus Christ does. Because according to the Bible, all you have to do is have faith in Jesus in order to be forgiven for your sins. And thus having faith in Jesus removes a person's own agency from their sins. This is basically like saying, no, I'm no longer responsible for my actions because somebody else died for my sins because of this thing that happened. Now, I've talked to a couple of people who know a thing or two about Christianity, and they said that this isn't true, that salvation through faith alone is not true, that no, you have to have faith and you also have to have works, that you also have to behave like Jesus. But those people are wrong, and now I'm going to cite from several parts of the Bible that doesn't have to do with the Church of Latter-day Saints. This is found in the regular Holy Bible. It's found in both Romans, and it's also found in Ephesians. Now I'm going to quote from it. There is no work or ransom payment that we need to do to be saved. We can, for it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Obtain this salvation free through Jesus. This clearly gets rid of our agency. But this next one from Romans 10, 9 through 10, also confirms this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And thus, 
you only need to be saved through faith alone. And now I'm going to go back to what the Church of Latter-day Saints says about Satan. And it says this, Heavenly Father allows Satan and Satan followers to tempt us as part of our experience in mortality. And then it cites these two things. Now I'm going to look at Nephi 2, 11 to 14, but I'm specifically going to look at Nephi 2, 13, because this is what I believe this salvation through faith alone does. This is what I, I believe that this salvation through faith alone and this idea that Jesus died for our sins actually does. And if you shall say there is no law, ye shall also say there is no sin. If ye shall say there is no sin, ye shall also say there is no righteousness. And if there be no righteousness, there be no happiness. And if there be no righteousness nor happiness, there be no punishment nor misery. And if these things are not, there is no God. And if there is no God, we are not, neither the earth. For there could have been no creation of things, neither to act nor to be acted upon. Wherefore, all things must have vanished away. This is actually what I believe this whole idea that Jesus died for our sins really does. It makes us believe that we don't have to worry ourselves with sin anymore. We can live a sinful life. As long as we believe in Jesus, we can be forgiven for our sins. This is what I mean by the devil didn't have to trick us into thinking that he doesn't exist. All he had to do was trick us into thinking that sins don't exist, or not that sins don't exist, but that sins can be forgiven by simply having faith in the actions of another man. This removes agency and it removes sinfulness. Now, let's look at the practices or the teachings of Jesus. Let's look deeper into them because I know some people will say, no, you also have to, to follow the practices of Jesus. And before I do that, actually, I want to go back to the Church of Latter-day Saints and what it says about Satan. And this is what else it says about Satan. He directs his most strenuous opposition at the most important aspects of Heavenly Father's plan of happiness. For example, he seeks to discredit the Savior and the priesthood, to cast doubt on the power of the atonement, to counterfeit revelation, to distract us from the truth, and to contradict individual accountability. See, the problem that I have with this is like, like okay, you know, talking about discrediting the Savior, well, the Savior himself discredits or contradicts individual accountability. He attempts to undermine the family by confusing gender, promoting sexual relations outside of marriage, ridiculing marriage, and discouraging childbearing by married adults who would otherwise raise children in righteousness. Now let's look at some of the teachings of Jesus. This is from the Church of Latter-day Saints, the Beatitudes. So shortly after his baptism by John the Baptist, Jesus taught his gospel and outlined how to be a righteous disciple in a powerful discourse called the Sermon on the Mount. During this beloved sermon, Jesus introduced a new standard of righteousness that expanded on the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill was no longer enough. Jesus required his followers to reject hatred, be forgiving, and even love their enemies. He asked for people to change their hearts as well as their actions. Now, my problem here, it contradicts Romans and it contradicts Ephesians. Because they clearly say that, oh, the commandments don't matter at all. You can be forgiven for your sins. You can be accepted by God by faith alone. So let's move on, though. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus also gave eight important teachings called the Beatitudes. The word beatitude means supreme blessedness or exalted happiness. The beatitudes highlight the amazing promised blessings that come when we develop certain righteous traits. Now I'm going to just go into Google and show what Jesus' teachings were, what the beatitudes were. One of them was love God. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
Forgive others who have wronged you. Love your enemies. Ask God for forgiveness of your sins. See, it doesn't say don't be a sinner. It just says ask God for forgiveness of your sins. So you don't actually have to listen or follow any of those beatitudes, really, as long as you're asking God for forgiveness of your sins and you have faith in Jesus and God. Jesus is the Messiah and was given the authority to forgive others. That's just a ridiculous beatitude to have. But once again, this has to do with salvation through faith alone. Repentance of sins is essential. Then don't be hypocritical. Now, to me, many of these beatitudes will actually allow for these things. It will allow for the undermining of the family. It will allow, it will actually make you accept these people who do these things. It says, love thy enemy. It says, love thy enemies. And not only will it allow you to accept those people, but hey, you can also end up becoming those people and be forgiven so long as you have faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to step away from biblical verses, and I'm going to now focus on the holiday of Christmas and Saturnalia. So Saturnalia, I'm sure a lot of people already know this. Basically, uh, Christmas came out of Saturnalia. So let's look at Saturnalia. Saturnalia is an ancient Roman festival and holiday in honor of the god Saturn held on 17th December of the Julian calendar and later expanded with festivals through to December 23rd. Now, what is actually being celebrated on this holiday? What is, what is the celebrations? It is festing, role reversals, gift giving, gambling, and of course other sinful acts. This role reversals is very, very, very important especially when it comes to the story of Jesus Christ. I see this role reversals. First of all, you see this role reversal in the movie The Nightmare Before Christmas, where you have Jack Skellington changing or trying to reverse the role of Christmas or reverse the role of Halloween. Instead of celebrating Halloween, he's trying to celebrate Christmas, and he's reversing his role to try to be that of Santa Claus. So that's where you see that role reversal. However... I believe that this role reversal applies to Jesus Christ being the Son of God. He's not the Son of God. He is the Son of the devil. Except that the devil was playing a role reversal at this time. So during this time, the devil was God and God was the devil. Or some weird thing like that. Now... Let's go further into this Saturnalia holiday to see more satanic things about it. Now, if you look up, is there a connection between Satan and Saturn? You will find this Quora article, and I think it has a brilliant answer to it. And the answer to this question, is there a connection between Satan and Saturn, is this. Yes, Saturn is the planet the Edomite Judeans associated with their god, now called Satan. The Edomites themselves were descendants of the tribe of Esu, or Esu, who mated with Canaanites, worshippers of Moloch. Moloch is a minotaur demon, half man, half bull, to which the Canaanites made sacrifices to. This is the golden statue of the bull. It's actually a representation of Moloch. It's not that they were simply idol-worshipping, is that they were worshipping an actual demon. Moloch's sign is the hexagram star. As such, the hexagram is a symbol of Canaanite origin in biblical times. Canaanite is a derivative of the progenitor Cain, Canaanite Cain, which is why it is used in the occult, Kabbalism, Orthodox Judaism, the modern flag of Israel. There is no such thing as a star of David in the Talmud, the Torah, the New Testament, etc. There's no star of David. The star of David is really a representation. It's a remodeling of the hexagram star of Moloch. This is why modern Jews revere the number six 
and why they hold the Sabbath on Saturday, the day of Saturn, Satan. Hence, to summon demons or to place an evil curse on others has historically been called a hex. Etymologetically, ancient jargon and symbolism that has derived into modern times. Now, that's just me reading that person's answer. I didn't provide that answer. I'm not trying to paint any religion or any group of people with a broad brush. I know that there's a lot of people online, there's a lot of people in the truth community who, who think that Jews are the ultimate enemy. The fact is, is that at the tops of every social group, Christianity, um, Islam, Judaism, atheism, all the, there are people in the tops of all of these groups who are the real bad guys, and most of the people in these groups are simply mindless masses believing the bullshit that they're told and not actually researching the stuff that they're told. Just like Jesus Christ is in fact the devil, and I have actually shown in other of my videos, I have a video where I show that Jesus Christ is a moon symbol, and what it really is is that all of these modern religions, well not all of these modern religions, all of these Abrahamic religions actually come from ancient cults that stem all the way back to ancient Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia, and all of these cults were basically satanic cults that were doing the exact same thing. They were all moon cults that were disguising themselves as sun cults. To the public, they presented themselves as sun worshippers or as a sun cult, but really, when you analyze them and you study them, you find that they're actually all moon cults and that they're basically Satanist. And this is where the devil got his horns from, or demons got their horns from, is it comes from the symbolism of the crescent moon. I've covered this in other videos. It's not like any one religion is satanic. It's not like Judaism is satanic and Christianity isn't satanic. It's not like those two are satanic and Islam isn't satanic. They're all satanic. In, their, in the real core of them, if you really understand them and you really study them, they are all satanic. And I think that this is what the Masons understand. This is the truth of the Freemasons is that they understand this little secret that what's really happening is there's this there's this underlying satanic worship. Now, we can ask ourselves, and, and we can look back on all of this, is it really satanic, or is this all part of the fact that God requires a satanic figure? God needs to allow evils to happen in order to test the people. Like, is it really satanic, or is this satanic element just necessary to test the people? Are they really worthy of the kingdom of heaven? And that's what I believe is actually going on. I believe that these Freemasons and the, and the people who are at the top, they believe that if people aren't able to see this, and if people, you know, if they buy into the satanic side, and if they choose to be evil then they deserve it. I don't necessarily think it's like just outright satanic. I think it's just this massive deception which they perceive as necessary in order to be a test for the people. And I'm not saying that I believe that. I'm saying that this is like their rationale. Like I'm sure that this is how they recruit people into their club. This is how they can get people to carry out such acts of evil because they rationalize it by saying that these acts of evil are actually acts of God or some crazy mindfuck like that. Like these people are beyond psychotic. And I really think that the Futurama episode, uh, Robot Planet, is really telling about this. Like in that episode, and I've mentioned this in previous videos of mine, or at least a previous uh, part of my documentary, The Club Uncensored, where in this episode of a Futurama, The Robot Planet, Fry, Leela, and Bender, they end up on this robot planet, and they come across the elders, and like when the elders are judging them, like Fry 
pretends to to have like superhuman evil powers like because on this robot planet they've gone with this propaganda that humans are like fire breathers for so long that when fry pulls us off on the robot elders the robot elders are like oh wait a second i can't remember if that's like part of our propaganda or if humans can really do that can they really breathe fire or did we make that up Gee, I can't remember anymore. It might just be from that stupid movie. Was that the original or the remake? And I think a similar thing might actually be applied to these psychopaths and their antediluvian fairy tales, where they might actually believe this propaganda. They might actually believe these stories which go back way, way, way further than Christianity and like Judaism and Islam. It goes way back to like ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia. And I believe it even goes back further than that. Like I believe that our understanding of when those time periods actually took place is much further back. So I think that like over millennia of this propaganda, of them using this propaganda, they themselves have actually began to believe it and then they thus use it as a rationale for their own evil behavior. And I think that like this is their rationale, that like this evil is necessary, that it's like part of this God's plan or, or like master plan or whatever. I don't know. You know, I'll admit that I don't really know what the fuck is going on because I'm not part of the club. This is just as far as I can decipher. This is what I have seen. This is what my research has led me to believe. Who knows? I could be totally fucking wrong. You know, I could have, like, not a single clue as to what I'm talking about. I don't think that I'm wrong. I mean, I've been researching this for a decade and a half. I have quite a bit of schooling under my belt. So it's not like I've just been reading conspiracy books this whole time. I've read a ton of books that are college books, that are books that they use in academia... So it's not like I'm ignorant and it's not like I'm only reading, you know, misinformation. So I don't think that I'm wrong. However, there is the possibility that I am wrong. I am always willing to have that as an option that I could be wrong. Any person who thinks that they're 100% right with anything is probably a fanatic and you probably shouldn't be listening to them. Because once you think that you're right, once you think you're 100% sure that you're right you stop looking at alternative information. You stop looking at information that contradicts the things that you believe. So I try to remain open to the possibility that I am wrong. And this is what allows me to continue to research and to continue to read and to continue to dig. But anyway, enough about me, enough with this video. I'm done with this. I'm sure I upset a lot of people. Who knows, I'll probably lose a couple of subscribers. It won't be the first time that I lose subscribers, and it won't be the last time that I lose subscribers. I've said this many times before. I don't really make these videos for other people. I make these videos for my future self. I want that if I die, or when I die, because it's not like if I die, I'm going to die eventually. I want that when I die, and I reincarnate, because I do believe in reincarnation, I want that when I reincarnate, I can come across, or at least there's a small chance that I can come across the information that I learned in this life. No limits. <laughs> it's we must look to the something strength like this. of our 